the Invincible class were the first battle cruisers in the world, although they weren't called by that name when they were first brought into service. They were the second design of ship brought about by Admiral Fisher, and were supposed to complement HMS Dreadnought and its successors. There's a separate video covering the original intended design of battle cruisers, so I won't go into depth on that here, but suffice to say the new Dreadnought battleships were so expensive that even Britain could not afford to build dozens of armoured cruisers at the same time. But they did need something to kill them, since the battleships now had to be focused at home. Enter the Dreadnought Armoured Cruiser, designed in great secrecy and thought by almost everyone to be a repeat of the Dreadnought concept, namely a unified main battery of heavy guns, in the British case 9.2 inch weapons. But what was built instead was equipped with 8 12 inch guns in four twin turrets, one fore and one aft, and one on each side, but with the wing turrets offset so that in theory a full 8 gun broadside could be given at narrow angles. 16 single 4-inch guns made up the secondary battery, alongside 7 Maxim machine guns, presumably just in case anyone felt the need to use the ship to oppress some small, poor tribe in the colonies, as well as 5 torpedo tubes. The ships were fast, for the time, capable of 25 knots, which was faster than almost any other armoured cruiser, and they managed 26 knots on trial runs. They were protected by 6 inches of belt armour, and this was actually at the top end of protection for armoured cruisers. In many ways, the ships resembled the hull of the previous Minotaur-class armoured cruisers, just with a radically different main armament. Three ships were ordered, Invincible, Inflexible, and Indomitable. Showing the speed of the British shipyards, they were all laid down in spring 1906 and were all in service by the end of 1908. Invincible entered service with electrically operated turrets, but these had to be converted back to hydraulic power once it became clear that the mechanisms were more often than not a good way of filling the turrets with man-made lightning, as opposed to making anything actually move. A slightly modified variant of the design was built as the three-ship Indefatigable class in 1909, but that's another matter for another video. The three ships spent their first years of service in the home fleet, but by 1914 they were in need of a refit to their engines due to heavy use. Invincible was therefore in England having this done when war broke out, whilst Indomitable and Inflexible were in the Mediterranean alongside the Indefatigable. Before we cover the First World War, let's just take a moment to reflect on the choice of name. If you're going to call the ship Invincible, you should probably make sure it's a bit better protected than an ambitious tin can, and you should also be absolutely certain that it's going to be state-of-the-art for years to come, as opposed to succeeded by much more powerful designs before a child born on the same day as the ship's launch has learned to speak. I mean, after all, even Hitler quickly renamed one of his ships to Lutzau when he realised he'd just gone to war with a ship named after Germany, the Deutschland, and the loss of such a ship would, of course, be a huge embarrassment. Anyway, the first battlecruiser action was the attempt to catch the Goeben and Breslau, but due to the lack of an engine refit, the British were not quite able to accomplish this. But since they were now there, the ships were ordered to attack the Dardanelles. This went well, and the Ottoman fortifications were heavily damaged in short order, but since no invasion force had been organised, the ships withdrew which, ironically, showed the Ottomans exactly where all their weak points were, and gave them time to fortify the area, which would eventually mean that the Gallipoli landings would be a bloodbath instead of a relatively easy victory. The next action was by the Invincible, tagging along at the tail end of the British battlecruisers at the Battle of Heligoland Bight. Due to her late arrival, she didn't accomplish anything of note, but shortly thereafter, Invincible and Inflexible were sent south to the Falklands to intercept Admiral von Spee's squadron. This battle was covered in detail in the video on the Scharnhorst class armoured cruisers, but in short it was a complete vindication of the original battlecruiser concept, and a crushing victory. Whilst they were on their way back home, the Indomitable was part of Dog the Battle of Dogger Bank and took part in the sinking of the Blucher, which again has its own video. On their way home, the Inflexible went to help the Gallipoli landings, but after some time doing fire, fire support duty, she managed to strike a mine and had to be towed away for repairs. By 1916, all three ships were back home as part of the battlecruiser fleet, but a critical flaw had developed. Due to incorrect lessons from Dogger Bank, the British Admiral in charge of the battlecruisers had become somewhat obsessed with rate of fire as opposed to accuracy. 
whereas in the Grand Fleet, it was the other way around. As such, many of the battle cruisers were stockpiling ammunition in their turrets and removing safety doors and interlocks in the ammunition supply system in order to get shells up to the guns faster. The three Invincibles were assigned to the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, which was sent to the Grand Fleet for gunnery practice at the end of May. At the Battle of Jutland, this policy showed its disastrous flaws. Sailing as fast as possible to support the other battlecruisers, who had already lost the Indefatigable and Queen Mary to massive explosions, the three ships came screaming south, sighted five German battlecruisers, asked for support, got no answer, and then in a display of insane bravery decided to press on and attack anyway. They blew straight through the German cruiser screen, exactly as designed, and steamed out of a fog bank at near point-blank range to the German battlecruisers. Their recent gunnery training paid off, and within ten minutes, Der Flinger and Seidlitz had taken multiple hits, and the Invincible landed a number of hits on the flagship battlecruiser Lutzau, which would ultimately be fatal. But at the end of those ten minutes, the Germans found the range, and within thirty seconds, blew apart Invincible in a catastrophic explosion, as what should have been an annoying hit that disabled a turret set off a chain reaction that reached the ship's magazines. A short engagement later on led to further hits on German ships, but nothing of any particular note. The surviving ships' careers were fairly quiet after that, being briefly considered for sale to Chile in 1920, before being scrapped as obsolete in 1921, shortly before the Washington Naval Treaty. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.